Hi everyone, I'm Joey, a current J2 student at Hwa Chong Institution and the working head of the Cyrus Study Club. So today we'll be talking about psychographic malware embedding in machine learning models. So some preface since it is false. So oops, let me get back. So for all the code here that I use as well like Namkai in the traditional libraries will be available at my GitHub at this link. So yeah. So a brief overview of what we're going to be going through today. Firstly, we'll be touching on classic psychography and speed balls. Next, the usage of AI as a fresh new medium and some mitigation methodologies for the attack vector described. So, what is psychography? If you're already familiar with this part, you can kind of just let your mind wander. Okay, so we can define psychography as a practice of representing information within a message or physical object in such a manner that the presence of the information is not evident to human inspection. And that's exactly what it is. But might be quite confusing. So let's try to take a more visual approach to understanding what this all means. So let's take a look. Okay. Let's split this word into its positive characters. Now, turn them into the single values. And the binary equivalence. Okay, now let's combine these three binary numbers together. By the way, each of these are 8 bits, so together 24. So given this 24 bit number or long binary string and the information that it contains three characters, or rather represents three characters, we could easily reverse the entire process of splitting them up, turning them into the decimal equivalents, then back to the ASCII representations. Okay, so that's very nice. Now let's take a look at this. An image from a few puppy. So what happens if you want to embed the word cap stereographically into this image? Well, first, you need to take a closer look at this image. So let's say this part of the dog's tongue, part of the dog's tongue, this is So here's an image, zoomed in image, representing the pixels of that specific part of the dog's tongue. Now let's take a closer look maybe at these few images, or these few pixels rather. Now let's zoom them in into a nice little grid and populate them with the RGB values. G values that correspond to the concentrations of red, green, and blue in the pixel, or also known as the pixel's color. Now let's get rid of all the messy color and left this nice little grid. So let's take a look at one specific RGB tuplet, whatever you want to call it. 177, 103, and 130. Now, it's binary equivalence. And now let's talk and ponder. What happens if we change the last bit of each binary number, also known as the least significant bit of that number? So keep your eye on the bottom right hand of the screen, because that will reflect the number, or rather the color, that the numbers on the left are currently representing, so not the right. So let's split the bits. And this color right here represents 177, 103, and 130. So now let's reflect the changes we made on the right to the left. And yeah, you can see that the numbers change by magnitude of plus minus one, but has a color on the bottom right change. Now it seems that it hasn't, but in actuality it has. So thus, this is the part where it's not evident in human inspection, because even though information has changed in the form of bits, we can't actually discern the change visually. Okay, so what happens if we extract the last three bits of the numbers now? We get 001. Therefore, we have successfully embedded and extracted 001 psychographically into a pixel value. Now, let's get back to our binary string that represents the word CAC. So how do we psychographically embed CAC into our image now? So we can do so in these few pixels, which are conveniently 24 pixels or so. So let's say we take each bit of the 24 bit number and we choose to embed it in, let's say, the last bit of the red value of the RGB value to blur. So we will look something like this visually. And in order to extract the information, we just extract the last bits out, arrive at this binary string, then we can reverse the entire process of splitting it up, turning them into the decimal equivalents and character values, and then combining them together to form the word cap. Okay, this is exactly what we want to achieve with AI models. But you might ask why AI models in the first place, like if you just work perfectly well, right? It seems quite simple in this case. Well, images have a few pitfalls or issues. So firstly, images are usually too small to embed stuff like programs. So for example, let's say you want to transmit a malware update to 10 megabytes, maybe even 50 megabytes sometime, or I'll see that it's like 100 megabytes. You should fit that in a phone that image that is 10 kilobytes. Now that probably wouldn't work very well. Then it's very easy to put false or possible embeddings. Because each integer value in the RGB value in the image is represented by 8 bits. And let's say maybe only five of those bits can be used because the first three bits will affect the image too much. And you make it obvious that something has gone wrong with the image. So it's very easy to prove all possible combinations with just five bits. 
In fact, there are already a lot of tools available online. They are coincidentally also open source, like CSTAC, for example, which helps you brute force all possible embeddings and then run some magnified comparisons. So, header bytes that tell Spogan what files the information is and tries to extract useful information for you, essentially. So, yeah, images just aren't really very good anymore. It's quite outdated technology. So, there are models. So, this is the motivation of the project. Evo model, a paper by these three individuals. So what do we want to achieve? Firstly, over delivery of information. Next, the ability to embed large amounts of data, which was previously impossible, with images. And lastly, an extremely high level of evasiveness against anti viral programs. Because remember, our context for this is malware. Some implications for the end use cases of this attack vector. Firstly, it can be used as a second layer data protection measure, whether it be for covert communications or the transmission of malware update files. And secondly, and most prominently, it can be used for the covert delivery of malware in C2 architectures. So if you are not familiar, C2 architectures are basically command and control architectures that are in C2, C squared, and it's where you have a bunch of command servers, which are mothership servers, and then you have a bunch of infected control servers or control machines. And lastly, it's almost impossible to attack when performed properly. So in order to understand how we exploit models to embed information in them, we must understand what are models we. So really, models are just a bunch of layers, which in turn are just a bunch of floats. So now we're going to ask ourselves, what are floats? So, tell us this is a float. 0 0.1234. 1, 2, so how do we represent this flow in binary? Or rather, how does a computer represent and understand this information? So, here's up. This is called the IEE 754 standard. Why it's called 754, I have no clue, but that's what it's called. And in order to try to unwrap and unpack this and understand it a little more, let's split this number into three parts the sign, exponent, and mendesa. So let's convert them into the other single equivalence now and perform these operations for that. For the sign, we take minus one to the power of the sign. So if you will notice and do some quick math, minus one to the power of zero is positive one, and minus one to the power of one is negative minus one. Next, we take 2 to the power of exponent, minus 1 to 7, and for the mantissa, which I have no idea why it's called the mantissa, we take the mantissa times 2 to the power of negative 23. So why we do all of this, I have no clue, but if you multiply the expressions together, somehow it gives you a pretty good approximation of what the original decimal was. So you don't really have to understand all of this, just, you know, cool back information, I guess. Okay, so our attack methodology is as follows. We use 32 bit embeddings or bit embeddings to embed information in the 32 bit space made available to us by the floats. Now, extraction can be done given a mass of embed and extractions. For example, if you want to use the first, third, and fifth float, maybe, or bit in the float, sorry, and then you drop it. So, complexity can be introduced in which layers are used for the embeddings, along with which bits are used for the embeddings, and which positions, and even what order, which gives us super flexibility and basically unpredictability. So I'll be doing a quick demo of what this attack looks like. So and we got a nice Jupyter notebook on here. So you can kind of ignore this part. Basically, all we are doing here is we are importing the VGG16. So that that doesn't work for some reason. One second. Ah, there you go. Okay. So we are Importing PyTorch and we're using a pre-trained VGG16, which is a image classification model. We're using a bunch of pre-trained games because uh, I'm lazy to train them myself. So you can see this is just me running the model. So you can see here the golden retrieval does pretty good, 95 percent, the daisy 100 percent, um, the auto cycle 72 percent as a mode, which is actually a small auto cycle, which is a fact. I just knew when I was making this, and the new fish 99.1 percent, the CFG 94 percent. So yeah, the model is pretty good basically. So here we're just reading and saving our exploit or payload to this um, variable here. So our payload in this case is actually Pony Shell, which you can readily Google up here, which is uh, actually open source also. So as Google can tell you, it's a single file PHD shell that is basically used for RCT, which is remote code execution, and it's only used in like CTFs and in the real world basically. Um, CTFs as in I use it for CTFs, I'm not sure about other people. So yeah. Here, all we are doing is importing FLT EMP, which is a library that we created. And all we are doing with this library is essentially doing some pre processing. And we are extracting the layers, or rather the weights of the first layer of the model. And here, we are embedding the payload into the model. So, this is our embed function right here. So, as you notice, there's a resolution parameter. In this case, byte, meaning we have to embed with byte resolution. So, we will only embed one byte every time. 
So we also have bit resolution, so we can embed one bit at every time, which is again better, I guess. Okay, so this is just in our case. So here, all we are doing is extracting or trying to extract information. We embedded. So you can see here, we successfully extracted this entire page we shall here. So yeah, we can do embeddings and extractions pretty successfully. All right, so now you might ask, we changed the model, right? Because we embedded stuff inside. So wouldn't that like screw the model, basically? Like the model we shared now. But that's not the case, actually. If you look at this, the golden retriever does better, in fact. The daisy, of course, 100% the same. The motorcycle, the same. The new fish, the same. And the sea engine, the same. So essentially, we managed to prove that by embedding and extracting in very strategic regions and resolutions, we can actually affect the model's performance by essentially zero percent. And in fact, our studies have shown that our own personal studies with mostly image classification models. So for stuff like large language models, we are not sure how we would interact, but mathematically, we would interact basically the same and change the accuracy very little. We can embed up to twenty bits of using the twenty bits of the Mantisa, and there's virtually zero performance impact. So no sufficient ways there. It's also not performance analysis metrics. So we retain a large amount of accuracy, which lowers detection rate and suspicion. Imagine you receive a model over the network and then you try to run it on some images and then it's like golden retrieval, but fire extinguisher and <laughs> it will raise some suspicion for the name. Okay, then this significant bit approach that we take also allows us to change the flow exponentially less. Because consider how binary works. The binary numbers at the end are worth less than the binary numbers in the front. Well, this is the same with our base 10 system also. But for binary, because we have a lot more digits, it's exponentially like less significant or more significant. And next, you can use lower embedding density and a strategic layer choice to achieve minimum performance decrease. So what do I mean by this? So in a model, let's say we have 14 layers. Not all 14 layers are worth the same amount. Some layers will affect the performance of the model more than others. So we can choose those layers which do not really affect the model's performance, and we can perform embeddings in that. Right. So you might ask, well, this seems like really OP and powerful, so what do we do? So mitigation methodologies are here to save you. So some key considerations first. Firstly, we want to preserve the model bad mitigation accuracy. So let's say you are a sysadmin, for example, and then you have an office which has an intranet, and you're working out of some malware, and the malware like, strips the model off from the internet. Or by chance it's not off the internet. Tries in this case because obviously it's not running on its own server. So ideally you want there to be a seamless flow of information. So you still want the model to be accurate. And also you want a high certainty of safety. Because obviously, let's say you do whatever post-processing with the model, like stripping the model of the information or scrubbing or whatever you have to do. Um you need a high certainty of safety because obviously you don't want yourself to like say, oh the model is safe, but then boom, it's not and then you're dead. And exploitation of the original payload might be quite interesting because in the case of corporate communications, or you want to add static or dynamic analysis on the original web. Okay. So these are why I explain that again. So the mitigation methodology. We can use the reverse logic of these significant bits don't affect model performance. So if you notice, that's the exact same logic that we use for our embedding bit choices. And we can stop the model with null bits or our own random bits to ensure that the payload cannot be extracted. Just envision this scenario. Let's say you have a malware file that is 10 kilobytes, for example. All you need to do is screw up one kilobyte of that 10 kilobyte malware file, and it's never going to run. Of course, it's possible to try to circumvent this by using something like a weight zero array, where you have information A, information B, and information C, and then you try to saw stuff together to get the original payload back. But I tried this, and in real life, it's really, really hard. And so it's a quick demo of what we mean by scrubbing the model. So our library also implemented this, we can use the same embed and extract function. So here we are just generating a bunch of random bytes, and we are filling the model with our random bytes. And when we try to extract the same payload that we uh, embedded before, which was successful when you see here, we get uh, basically a bunch of gibberish. So yeah, that's one way you can mitigate this kind of attack surface or vector. And again, yeah, it's not really going to affect the model performance as much as we have shown. Okay, so when we look at a small cybersecurity kind of standpoint, which is recover, recovery visibility. Because let's say you have some an opponent somewhere that's transmitting information covertly using this attack surface. And of course you want to snoop in on the information, right? Not only you want to screw it up, you want to snoop in. So how hard is it for me to recover and let the data you ask? 
Well, with 32 bits available, it's quite hard and quite it's quite an understatement here. So let's do some math. Uh, things to work on alpha. So let's say with 32 bits, we can perform this summation of k equals to 1 to 32, and we do 32 bit k. So it gives us this fat number here with a number of possible permutations that you can choose from. So um, I don't think, or at least I don't have the technology at home to prove all this. So let's try a more reasonable range. Let's say we use 23 bits, because obviously you want to affect the sign by exponent, because that will affect the model's performance a lot. So let's use the 23 bits, and we do the same summation, and we arrive at this number. So it looks really hard to prove false also. Might possible to prove false, but I don't think so. So let's try to narrow down our range to see where it starts becoming possible. So here's 16 bits, which you get this number, which again, it's I'm pretty sure with my laptop here, I cannot prove all that, but maybe NSA is a GPU cluster possible. Okay, but one key thing about recovery revisibility is, I mean, how fast can you extract the information, right? Because let's say you have 100 million iterations, but each extraction takes one minute. So that's not really very possible. So that's where we do binary operator tricks. So here, all we're doing is just timing the extract functions, and we're putting a nice square for you right here. So again, we have two functions, but extract and did extract. So but extract is this blue line, and did extract is that jagged orange line. So as you can see, for byte extract, it takes virtually zero seconds to embed 400,000 kilobytes. Actually, this is yeah, 400,000 bytes of data into a, let's see here, into a 10,000 by 10,000 array, a numpy array. So basically, with byte extractions and embeddings, it takes virtually no time. In fact, if you run this for, if you max out your RAM complete, so on my home system, I bought the of RAM, I max it out, it basically takes like 0 0.1 seconds or so. Okay, but for bin extraction, that's where it becomes a bit more complicated. So you notice that for bin extraction, as the size increases, this means a linear increase because you can think of it kind of as a for loop in the background, although we don't really use a for loop. So basically, for 1,000 iterations, it takes 17.5 seconds to extract 400,000 bytes. So it's still quite fast. So it's very possible to try to brute force their extractions. Okay, so some closing thoughts and notes. So. One thing I would like to show is our optimization tricks. So this project was actually originally done with another organization, which had around uh, maybe times 250,000 times or times 1 million speed up from our code here. So here we are really just doing some, if you will notice, we are doing a lot of binary operators. So it's another way that binary operators can really save your life when you're trying to perform a lot of operations at the same time. So Instead of group forcing with four loops, you can consider trying that. And yeah, that's what I'll Thank you.